Welcome to another episode of the Cal Korf TV show here on Daily World Television. My name is Cal Korf and I'm your host. Folks, in addition to giving you a hearty welcome, I want to explain that we have a very special show for tonight. It is the longest one that we have recorded to date and it needs to be on the long side because it concerns a very important election that is going to be decided in about two days time in the United States of America. This is the election, of course, to determine who is going to be the next president of America. It's either going to be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Now, as an American, I can tell you that this election is unlike anything the United States has ever experienced before. It's actually unlike anything history has ever seen before, only that's not necessarily a positive thing in this case. Now, regardless of who wins, the United States is arguably a divided country. The divisions in America have not been this great since the time of the Vietnam War. I think one can objectively say that. So the stakes have never been higher because regardless of who wins the next election, they must turn the fortunes of the United States around for the better, for the more positive, they must undo damage that has been done to the country for decades, and more importantly, they must be careful to wade through the minefield of challenges and lead America forward in the right way with the right policies to get the right bills and the right laws passed to force genuine change for the better. If they don't do that, things are going to get a lot worse. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this show is because an objective case can be made, one that can be fact-checked, one that can be argued logically and sanely, that if you look at the two candidates who are the finalists in this presidential election, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, one can argue objectively that if Donald Trump wins the presidency, this will be the worst thing that can happen for the United States. And that is the position that I am taking as host of this show. The reason I'm saying this as both a journalist and an American is because the case against Trump can be and must be argued logically, not emotionally. Now, for those of you who support Donald Trump, I know that you're very aware that I have absolutely criticized the Democrats over the years and Hillary Clinton. That's fair game, I've done it. I do it because, in my opinion, it is wrong to not talk about the problems. I don't care who's doing it. And if there's any chance to reform the Democrats or anybody, you talk about the problems so they can be addressed, so that they can be fixed. If you avoid them, that is the worst thing you can do. What amazes me when I criticize the Democrats is how polarized the American people have become. I'll, g I'll give you a quick example. In the past, uh, over a course of many decades, I have published many articles, I've written books about the conspiracy mindset, conspiracy nuts, people who believe that John F. Kennedy was killed as a result of a conspiracy, that there was a second gunman on the grassy knoll, which is not true. People believe that in 1947 a UFO crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, and that the U.S. government retrieved alien bodies and they're still covering it up today. That is not true either. It used to be that if you exposed a UFO case or a false claim about a Kennedy conspiracy, these nuts and fanatics would say, oh, you must say all UFO cases are a hoax. Even though you're not, you're just saying this one incident is not true. So I've been used to the conspiracy uh, win or lose all mindset insanity for years now. I don't like it, I've helped expose it, but I'm used to it meaning I've seen it for decades now. What bothers me about this election is how polarized it has become. If I dare to criticize Hillary Clinton, I have Clinton supporters telling me that it's because I'm a neocon or because I'm a shrill for Donald Trump. Nonsense, I'm not a shill or shrill for anybody, okay? I'm actually neutral. I don't support either candidate. But I will tell you why real quickly, and we talk about it briefly in the upcoming interview in a moment. I don't support Hillary Clinton because, in my opinion, the contest that the Democratic National Party 
held in the primaries was rigged against Bernie Sanders. I did support Bernie Sanders. If the contest had been fair, and we know from hacked documents that are unquestionably authentic that it was not fair, we know that the head of the Democratic National Party, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, resigned in disgrace over rigging and, and not playing it fair. You have Donna Brazell, who has resigned or was fired from CNN because she was leaking information to the Clinton campaign. She's now head of the Democratic Party. Several people resigned over this scandal. Bernie Sanders himself had said, it's rigged. Now, this doesn't prove that Sanders could have won. Unfortunately, we'll never know because it wasn't a true fair contest. But I personally, as an American, have a problem with the system where a candidate before the first ballot is cast gets 400 superdelegates right off the bat. Well, that's a lead that is unlikely to be overcome by any opponent, regardless of how credible. And there are other ways that the contest was rigged. You can look at the emails which are authentic that were hacked, and you can look at the disgrace that is the epitome of the leadership of the Democratic Party. And if you look at what they're doing and what they've done now with the uh, formal nomination of Hillary Clinton and the fact that she is one election away from possibly being the next president of the United States, we can thank a candidate like Bernie Sanders and progressives and liberals for going ahead and pushing Hillary towards their cause and to champion it because whoever is the winner must champion much of what Sanders was saying. Now, let's talk about Donald Trump. I've never been a Republican. I never will be. I don't believe in the conservative mindset. I believe in moving forwards, not keeping things stuck and frozen in time. Now, as an American living in India, I see the conservative mindset a lot, trust me, even more than in the United States. If I don't like it here, uh, this, some of this conservatism, what I call Stone Age thinking, I'm sure not gonna like it in the United States as well, where they have less of it, but they still have very serious problems. So, I repeat, I do not support Hillary Clinton. I do not support Donald Trump. I supported Bernie Sanders. However, since the election has come down to two people, for better or for worse, I would have to support Hillary Clinton if I was forced to do so. And the reason I am so concerned over a Donald Trump presidency is articulated by our guest. We agree. He shares some incredible insights into not only the games and the crimes that the Republicans have played by engaging in voter suppression, which doesn't seem to command the headlines that uh, voter fraud does in the American media and shame on them for not covering this the way they should. He outlines a bunch of problems that the Republicans are the guilty parties behind and are responsible for causing. And he outlines the problems that will happen that are quantifiable and objectively arguable if Donald Trump becomes the next president. So I will repeat again my stance. I don't support Hillary. I do not support Donald Trump. In this election, I'm voting for neither, okay? I'm not gonna give either my vote, period. I object to the way the Democrats ran their primaries and I object to Trump. Now, having said that, if I were forced to vote for one of these two candidates, and thankfully I'm not, I would choose Hillary Clinton. Now, rather than take my word for it, the whole point in doing this show is to lay out an objective case for why it is that a Trump presidency must not happen and would be a disaster. The purpose is to get the message out, to have you think over what you're going to hear now, because it's all factual. You can weigh the issues yourself. Enough information and sources are provided by our guests so that you can independently verify these details yourself. And then it's up to you when you cast that ballot 
And let's say you're watching this and you're not an American, you're not gonna be part of this election, that's okay too, because you're gonna learn a lot of very fascinating stuff, the nature of which has universal lessons for all of us. Issues of voter fraud, voter suppression, racism, hatred, those are all universal issues that hound and plague every country that professes or proclaims to be a democracy. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you our very special guest from Washington, D.C. His name is Art Levine. He is a top veteran, longtime investigative journalist and columnist. He is a blogger for the Huffington Post, and he is a contributing editor for the prestigious magazine, The Washington Monthly. As I say in the interview that we had with him by phone via Skype, he is a walking encyclopedia of this stuff. He will share with you his very valid insights, and I think you're gonna learn a lot of stuff even if you're not really that interested in this subject. It's just fascinating. So I present to you without any further ado, our special guest in an uncensored, unedited interview with ACE investigative journalist and editor and columnist, Art Levine. Welcome to another episode of the Cal Corf TV show. My name is Cal Corf and I'm your host. Folks, as I've explained many times now, we cover everything from politics to the paranormal. And tonight's episode is rather special because it's gonna be focused on politics. Now, I'm not just talking about normal politics. I'm talking about what is undeniably, unquestionably, the most important election coming up on Tuesday, November 8th. It's of course taking a place in America. It is the election to determine who is going to be the next president of the United States. Will it be Democrat Hillary Clinton or will it be Republican challenger Donald Trump? Here to talk about the election and give us some insights is ACE investigative journalist and reporter Art Levine. He writes for the Washington Daily and also the Huffington Post. He has a very long career and he has a book coming out next year on some of the scandals that are going on with the VA hospital and the treatment of veterans by the U.S. government. Art, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, except like many, I am a progressive and like many, I'm a progressive but a fair-minded reporter. By the way, the magazine I'm a contributing editor of is the Washington Monthly. Um, not the Washington Daily. I'm fine, except we're anxious as hell, uh, as many Americans are, about this election. Regardless of what side they're on in America, it's actually causing upswings in depression and anxiety. And uh, basically, uh, clinicians are reporting uh, that their patients with who already have some emotional problems are already having them exacerbated. And even Hillary Clinton has mentioned that people are, you know, sleep racked, uh, sleep starved, uh, stomach upsets, and nervous about the forthcoming election, which is extremely important. And each side, as you know, has an apocalyptic view of what would be the impact on the world if the other person's uh, champion is elected. So are you saying that this is a sure way that Obamacare enrollments will now go up because people will have record levels of being sick because of this election? Well, I, I, it, it, when open enrollment is available, yeah, enrollments uh, in Obamacare might go up, but the Obamacare uh, program has uh, been uh, become problematic because of the rise in the in the. Uh, uh, the monthly premiums people have to pay. However, uh, about 20 million new people got health insurance who previously didn't have health insurance. So in that regard, it's it's a plus. However, uh, healthcare, as you know, is is a very important issue. And but it's not the, it, the it's not the issues or controversies that are driving this election. I I understand. So let's uh, we can come back to Obamacare later in the show, but. Let me let me ask you this. You're an American. I'm an American. We're both Jews. Let's say that for what it's worth. I've lived outside our country, the USA, for almost 17 years now. So I'll ask you a very personal question, a public question. 
how is my country doing? How is, what is the state of America today? It's certainly not the country that I remember when I left 17 years ago. I happen to think that in some small, I think in general it's worse than it was when you left. Now what year did you leave? I, so I'm terrible at math. <laughs> <laughs> no, I left in the year 2000. I Okay, in the year 2000. Uh, so things were better. Here's why things are things are worse on several fronts. Um, certainly since you left, and even so, basically uh, the economy has recovered somewhat, and job uh, official unemployment figures are down to four point five percent. Economy has recovered uh, in general since the the uh, crash in two thousand eight, but. There is still a widening gap between the poor and the rich, and the level of distrust and hostility and paranoia in America at this point has not been, it, it is the highest it has been since, since 1968, which is when the, the country was very divided and there were assassinations and, and so on. So the, things are, I think, as tense politically, and I do think the, the, the Donald Trump campaign has made things worse because he is the most uh, sort of charismatic, uh, right-wing, um, racist appealing demagogue who's ever headed a major party campaign and uh, a ticket and could become president. And he's deliberately exacerbated the existing divisions. In other words, he took advantage of the divisions that already exist in America. So it's not like blacks and whites didn't distrust each other or that there wasn't fear of Muslims or fear of immigrants and all those issues or concern about crime, although the crime rates are down in general, but in some urban cities in the last few years they have gone up. But regardless, the existing areas of alarm and concern, including the fact that many, many white males and males of all kind no longer have the good paying jobs they might have had 25 years ago. So the, the loss of manufacturing, the downscaling of so many businesses means that men uh, are particularly weakened in the society and are very, very angry, um, and so on. So these divisions were already there, and then we have a candidate like Trump who is feeding many of people's pre-existing biases and fears. So that's what's made this current election season the most perilous in American history. Now, when you say the most perilous, of, I, I think I agree with you because, um, I, as, and I've written about this in the Daily World newspaper, and I've said in my TV broadcast that I have not seen the United States so divided since the time of the Vietnam War, and that's nothing to be right. proud of. So I'm afraid that if Trump wins, that's going to be the worst thing that can happen to the United States and its international relations. Because if it's bad for America, it's bad for the world because of our unique position in the world compared to most other countries. So let's go down the list here. What is the single biggest problem that you see, in your opinion, with a Donald Trump presidency? If you had to sum it up in, in one issue, and we'll get down to some of the other issues in a moment, what would it be? What is the worst thing? My feeling is, and this sounds apocalyptic, but, uh, you know, it, based on different, I think the real possibility of uh, first strike nuclear weapons use, if he loses his temper and there's no safeguards over, uh, so this is a theme of the Clinton campaign, and they obviously have ads about it where they show his, you know, his intemperance, you know, caught on tape. Uh, where he's, you know, saying, well, tell them to go F themselves. I don't know whether we can curse on this uh, 
discussion, so I'm not going to risk it. Uh, but his lack of temperament and the line that she used is that someone who could be baited, that Hillary used, that someone who could be baited by a tweet should not be in charge of the um, nuclear codes. And he, he also was reported to have said in some of the pr- briefings that he received from foreign policy advisors who were, you know, already right-wing militaristic, he said, well, why can't we use them right now? Or what's wrong with using the weapons now? In other words, he, he basically doesn't understand the dangers, and he's lived in a bubble that I have. I happen to think he's a sociopath and a narcissist. I don't think he's a psychopath, but I do think he doesn't have normal human empathy, and he's an extreme narcissist. And so we have, we have someone who always wants to prove himself right. Now, if you had, um, if you had, for whatever reason, North Korea, for instance, leader wants to get in the news by uh, baiting Trump or doing something outrageous that would, you know, maybe lead in a normal era to condemnation by the UN or condemnation, we'd have a president who would go, let's go, go, go nuke him. Or he's said, we, you know, he has a freewheeling attitude about the use of bombing, military power, and nuclear weapons, even though he's also said that NATO countries and Japan should be, be paying more of their fair share but I do think that that is, that is something that the world itself has to be wor- wor- worried about because, because of uh, the nuclear weapons, but in general is indifferent and hostility to the no- notion of negotiations. Now, I think you, there's reasonable questions that can be asked about whether deals that have been struck with, say, Iran, uh, uh, you know, are, are too full of holes, as you well know, and not strongly. But the mere notion of negotiation at all as a tool of diplomacy, I don't, even though he calls himself the master of the art of the deal, it's deals that will work out 100% in his favor. And I don't think he has any sense of the real world. And he has a, a very dangerous temperament. So my that's what I think is literally the worst single thing that could happen under a Trump presidency. A first strike nuclear attack somewhere. Or he's already said that he, he wouldn't... I'm not sure which countries he mentioned, but he, said, he has said that he wouldn't mind giving the nuclear weapons to... I forget which countries you may remember you know, one or more Mideastern countries that don't have it that he feels are allies. So he's, he's extremely reckless. Uh, you know, I, th- I agree with you. I wrote a piece that Daily World published saying specifically why Donald Trump is not qualified to be the next president of the United States. I wish the piece could have been longer because I think you can write a book on it just citing all the nonsense he right. said on the campaign. It's ridiculous. But... In the main points, one of the first ones I mentioned was exactly what you said, going into less detail because of space limitations, that he doesn't have the temperament for it. And because he's never held public office, he doesn't understand fundamentals. And you are right. If he goes off the way he has over something somebody says on Twitter, my God, can you imagine what it must be like when there's no reporters around? It's just mind-boggling. So I, I think you're 100% right on that, Art. I really do. And, and thank you for that insight because, you know, I've known you well enough to know that you think these things through clearly. You don't just fly off the cuff like Trump does. And a lot of people are saying this guy is bad news. And you have seen it. I have seen it. The guy incites violence at his rallies. Uh, he talks about punching people. And just, it's ridiculous. It's a level of politics that shouldn't be there. And that's- Well, the other thing, but yeah, I, I, but, it's a, but even from a sheer point of view of, dem- even if you just took his point of view, 
I'm, let's say I want to win and I want to appeal to the basest elements of the American public. Let's assume those are ground, you know, rooted uh, basics of his th- Even taking entirely his point of view, he does, he's not able to uh, even promote his point of view as effectively as he could. With all the so you know, to me, one of the signs is you know after that second debate where where he wanted to prove himself right about the Miss Universe from Venezuela being fat, yeah. okay, and he spent a week after the debate doing that. Now, so that ad, however, it seems to me that. Um, Trump's success and that that things are so narrow and it's worth us talking, telling your listeners. I mean, there's websites like Real Clear Politics and 538 that are worth looking at to indicate that at this point, if you look at um, uh, the states, if you look at Real Clear Politics, which has a breakdown of different things, the, uh, the spread between them. Uh, is now within the margin of error. It's less than 3%. So it's very striking that a person of his lack of temperament and his complete unfitness for the office of president is in fact within striking distance of becoming a president. And that's in large part, I think it's more due to Hillary Clinton's weaknesses as a candidate than the bigotry and hatred that uh, and xenophobia and paranoia and fears that Trump is able to um, uh, gin up in the public and 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 that, so Hillary and you I think it's valuable for people who follow you on Facebook you have been very very highly critical of both Obama in very vituperative terms, similar to far right uh, people, but you're not far right of both Hillary and of Obama. So it would be enlightening to me and to your readers to kind of explain your views and where your political framework is regarding Obama, Clinton, and Trump and what your attitudes are. Well, thanks for asking. And of course, uh, I want everyone hearing this to know that this is not scripted. It's unscripted, which is the way I prefer things. But thanks for asking. And I'll be happy to do that real quickly. Um, First of all, I don't support the Democrats or the Republicans. And I'll tell you why. I was a Democrat all of my life until the late 1990s during the waning days of the first Clinton presidency. I'm saying first because I'm hoping honestly that Hillary Clinton does win. Now, the reason that I was a Democrat was because the way I was raised and I identified more with the Democrat ideology that used to exist, but I'm not quite sure it does anymore. And I worked with a gentleman at Boeing. It was the last job I had in the United States before I moved to Europe in the year 2000. He worked for Bill Clinton for many, many years when he was governor of Arkansas. And he used to tell me all kinds of stories. And I thought that he was exaggerating. And then one day this event happened, I'll share with you, and and it it, it blew all of our minds. We had these weekly meetings in Boeing where we would get caught up on what was happening in our department because different people in our department, I was in the standards division, so we would often not interact with each other very much until these weekly meetings because we'd be off doing different projects and we couldn't talk about some of them among each ourselves because there were clearance issues involved. I started out in commercial aircraft group and ended up doing work in defense and space as well. So what happened is one day he comes to our meeting, he was always running a little late because he had to come from another completely different area of the company and Boeing is spread out. And he came in laughing one day and we're like, what's so funny? And he told all of us point blank that Bill Clinton is going to admit that he did have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky, that what he said months ago was a lie and that a secret deal has been cut between him and Hillary, that basically she's gonna carpet bag it off to New York, uh, Robert Kennedy style, run for Senate, put in just enough time to seem credible and go straight back to the White House. And that's the deal. It's been done. It's gonna be announced shortly. And uh, not that part of the deal, but that's the deal that's been made between the Clintons. And in exchange for that, she will not divorce him. 
And I said, you're, you're exaggerating. Come on, quit pulling our leg. So I asked permission to get off early from work to go watch Clinton's live address. And sure enough, he gets up there and says there was inappropriate contact, the usual euphemisms. And then when he said, I did it first to protect myself and then my family, my thought was this, you bastard, how dare you put yourself first instead of the American people? You are not worthy of holding this office anymore. And then when I saw some of the other candidates who ran on the Democratic platform, I was never a Republican. I, I will never be a Republican. I do not support right-wing ideology. But my view is this. If there's any chance to reform America, we need either a viable third-party candidate, which does not exist, or we have to attack the Democrats and expose them so that they can't get away with this. The Republicans are a lost cause. So before Obama was elected, when I lived in Europe, I said point blank that Obamacare would be a disaster just as he rides out in the sunset, that this should have been single payer. It should have been done the way the Europeans did it. And I know that because I was enjoying the benefits of European health care. For five euros a month, I could get dental care as well anywhere throughout the continent. It was beautiful. And Obamacare doesn't even deal with um, you know, dental care. So what I've seen is the Democratic Party become controlled by vested interests. The banks get away with, with whatever they want. I knew Obama would never put anybody in jail and I knew he would never hold Wall Street accountable. So yeah, when I feel that somebody's lying, as a journalist, I will say he's lying. I'm known for being blunt. I'm not 100% right, I'm human. But as far as I know, I can back up everything I say with facts. And what I've seen happen, Art, which cuts to the crux of your question, is this. It used to be just in UFO and conspiracy nut circles that if you said a certain UFO case was a hoax, these nut jobs would say, oh, you're saying all UFOs are hoaxes. When I'm not, I'm saying only a certain case. Now I'm seeing the same stupid behavior among mainstream people who say that if you attack the Democrats or you attack Hillary or you attack Obama, you must be a right-wing neocon. When it doesn't mean that, it simply means the point I'm saying, nothing more, nothing less. And I believe that you focus on what's wrong, not what's right. What's right takes care of itself. And since the Republicans are a lost cause, shame on them for being the party of no. My fear is that if Hillary Clinton does win this election, and I'm not a fan of hers. I think she has real problems. I think the Republicans are going to be even worse. If you think they're the party of no now under Obama, wait till their old nemesis Hillary gets back there. Because look at the games they used to play. So that's why I do what I do, because I want us to solve our problems. And right. Here, here, here's, yeah, I, can I give you my perspective? On Absolutely. What you, yeah, so... My view is that um, is that I do think that the tone of a lot of your attacks on both Obama and Hillary were so um, I thought hyperbolic on their person uh, sort of personal language and rhetoric that it basically echoed the far right and was almost indistinguishable as opposed to legitimate policy criticisms which you could have now in two areas where Obama didn't go far enough, which is obviously, and I was outraged, I did a lot of reporting about what the, I did reporting for In These Times and also Huffington Post following the healthcare debate issues. I've also done a lot of work on voting suppression issues, which we'll talk about a bit later. But, so here's what Obama, and, and I've also looked carefully at how they screwed up on the response to Wall Street and the stimulus packages. So in three big areas, he was not as successful as he should have been. And there was definitely sellouts. Now, but if we take Obamacare, which he made his sort of big priority when he started and people were saying, well, let's work on other stuff, he basically... I think that he was acting, he should, there was a very strong push by the progressive movement 
inside the Democratic Party and many, many of the people who were part of organizing for Obama that then became organizing for America that was defanged deliberately by the Obama campaign. I know we're getting the weeds here, but it's very important why we did not get the public option on the table from the get-go. And there's, a, there's it's a combination of, here's my theory, but it's based on some solid reading is one is he faced a very recalcitrant and sections of recalcitrant all over and a subset of GOP that were deeply racist and feeding the real hostility of their base by delegitimizing, um, you know, Obama. So it fed that very deep opposition. They said, you know, the famous meeting that McConnell had. I think literally the day of the election or the day after they actually met and they said we are going to make sure our priorities to make sure that he's a one-term president and we they literally had a meeting the yeah. top saying we it's going to be a one-term one-term only and we're going to oppose everything he does so that was the uh, arena that he was facing against him now what happened on his side was that he had um, sort of pro-corporatist advisors and sellout types from Rahm Emanuel to, um, you know, people on the financial teams like Rubin and others. So the concept is he had advisors that were sort of pro-corporatist who didn't want to really take on corporate interests, even though the Democratic base wanted to. And so on Obamacare, they decided, and then we have to, to me, I'm adding the background of the psychology and his, his actual religious views, which are, he sees the good in others, and he's a black man who is, rose up through the ranks by, by being a person of reason and decency and civility to counteract racism that black people in Canada all the time. So the last thing he wants to be is appearing to be an angry black man who's like, I, this is my sort of psychology plus politics reading. So he did not, he did not come, he didn't use the bully pulpit is what it amounts to. And John Alter, who I'm friendly with and had great access to him, said that Obama's biggest weakness was communication which is striking because he's a fabulous orator. However, he did not harness his oratory to ramp up the American public for the strongest possible stimulus package that wouldn't be weakened by needless Republican tax cuts. He didn't ramp up his oratory because he had all his sellouts within the administration who were shaped by Clinton pro-corporatists like Summers and Rubin and everybody else, all the people and uh, Geithner, all those people, and it's 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 explained extremely well in books by Ron Suskin and others. Exactly how they sold out on Wall Street, which you're totally correct on. The bills that they were proposing were horrible. So in these three areas, uh, Obama had his reluctance to be a tough negotiator because he would go to the table with one arm behind his back already giving up the public option. Now, now those of us who were following the health care debate, one of the things that was very striking is they kept saying, all the liberals kept saying for months, why don't you use reconciliation where you kind of force it through as part of a budget process and they wouldn't do it. What happened was they kept saying no, 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 and there's famous incidents where Rahm Emanuel, when he was chief of staff, would literally come into the meetings of liberals and progressives and curse them out for trying to push for stronger uh, Obamacare um, uh, legislative language, okay? Would literally curse them, and if you look up Rahm Emanuel cursing progressives and Obamacare and Google, you'll see the stories. So they were pushing back against the progressives. And through all of this, the progressives were saying, 
including Sanders, but many others, including a group that I'm familiar with and sympathetic to called Democracy for America, was let's use the reconciliation tool, which is a, a way to get something attached to legislation, and this is when the Democrats were in the voting majority, and you could pass a budget measure that wouldn't allow amendment and would allow it to sort of get through and not get filibustered, okay? And they didn't do it for almost the entire thing. And then, this is very arcane, but it's important for your listeners to understand it. So, at the very end, when it looked like the entire Obamacare was gonna go down in flames, like literally the last week, the Obama administration said, oh, we're gonna pass our version, the weak, weak loophole-filled version that is now bedeviling American customers and businesses without with reconciliation and they got it through now they could have used the same method eight months a year earlier for a strong measure but they didn't do it so uh this is so what i'm saying it's a combination of one of the world's worst negotiators dealing with one the most recalcitrant congress and the guy who failed to use his his natural gifts, uh, both similar to, in other words, opposed to what, what LBJ did with the civil rights movement. LBJ said to the civil rights movement, and I think FDR said things similar to the union movement back when he was in office, I want to be able to support you, but you're going to have to make me do it. Meaning, you will have to drive a campaign that will strengthen my hand to get these, you know, pro-labor movement uh, laws in the 30s and 40s and the civil rights laws in the 60s. He did not do that with the progressives. In fact, and this is sort of like a nuance that, again, sounds arcane, but is pretty significant. And Rolling Stone wrote about it, uh, a reporter named Dickinson, there was a what, the key thing that everybody expected to happen is you had this uh, very charismatic presidential candidate win the election through the unbelievable use of high tech and ground force uh, street level uh, organizing of uh, organizing for Obama. Okay, what happened? So everybody expected that this incredible army. Obama's army of supporters who were all networked in. They're all ready to go. And then the drive came, and I now I know I'm talking here at some length, but I think it's important for you to understand why Obamacare was so terribly weakened. Because I was there as a reporter and an advocate in the meeting. And one of the things that happened was, um, so one, they defanged, Obama's army. It was a deliberate attempt, and there was a dispute between uh, some members of Obama's staff who said, why don't we use our army to help push Congress and the majority and rulings within the confines of the White House were no, that'll be too alienating to the Republicans in Congress and could backfire and we're going to try to do uh, we're going to try to do uh, more, more inside baseball, inside negotiation, so we don't create bad publicity and turn off the Republicans. Well, obviously that didn't work, and it wasn't working for months, but they didn't change their strategy. So they defanged OFA. Now, I'm going to tell you something you're not going to believe that you may have not have paid attention to, but the early days of the... Uh, drive for Obamacare, okay? This is really true. I showed up at these meetings and we were expecting, we came there going, what can we do to support getting a strong, uh, you know, a healthcare bill passed? We would show up, they'd be organized by some scattered remnants of this defanged uh, or Obama for America. Now it was uh, it's now called Obama for America. You go to a person's home. I am not kidding. We go there hoping that we get marching orders about how to generate pressure in Congress. 
What was it? It was these touchy-feely new age listening sessions about what we would like to see in terms of if we had better health care. What would it mean to us? Literally not one word of strategy, not one word of organizing. That was what the early months were like. And people were tearing their hair out and they wouldn't change. So that's some of the reasons that we have, we're stuck in the, the situation we are now in terms of all those issues you mentioned, Wall Street, Obamacare, you know, pro-corporate stuff, and also the, uh, that the stimul that the recovery hasn't been as strong as it should have been. It's been strong, but it could have been much better if we didn't give this meaningless 30 percent of all those billions was going to meaningless tax cut to Republican businesses to get the Republicans on board because there was no strong external lobbying of Congress by progressives. And that was a deliberate decision by the by the Obama White House. Well, I hadn't heard the part that you just shared a moment ago about uh, this touchy-feely stuff in the meetings. I was familiar with the other stuff because I was following it when I had just moved to Europe and I was pulling my hair out over this because I had friends in the U.S. who were so hardcore Obama, they thought Jesus had come back to earth. And I kept telling them, he's not going to succeed, he's not going to be a big uniter. This change we can believe in is really chump change. And so, yeah, that may sound like right-wing rhetoric, meaning that his critics are saying the same thing. But I feel, unlike the right-wing guys, I had the facts to back it up. In my opinion, it would be a, a big stretch for a person to go from two years in the Senate to suddenly being qualified to be president. I don't care who you are. And I, as a speaker myself, long time started lecturing when I was 13. I know all the gimmicks that you can use in a speech and I saw all the parlor tricks. And when Obama came to Prague, let me share this story with you. I went to see him because my friends dragged me there. And this was his first foreign policy speech after he became president. Hillary Clinton was secretary of state and he's in Prague up at the castle area very, I'm very familiar with. I was working at a Czech newspaper at the time, daily columnist. And Obama suddenly says, with Hillary's backing, of course, this was her prize uh, trophy of the day, that the reset with Russia has now happened. And I'll never forget the reaction of everyone in that audience. It went from being total Obama, and I'm the weird one who's not pro-Obama, to what is this guy smoking? The Czechs of all people know damn well that there was never going to be a reset from Russia. They understand Russian mentality very well. They were under its thumb because the West gave Czechoslovakia to Stalin, of course, after uh, we helped liberate it from Hitler. That never made any sense to me. And a lot of Czechs asked me about that. And then when they asked about Obamacare, they would laugh at me in the pubs and say, what is it with you Americans? You can send spacecraft to Mars, but you can't give people health care. We've got a better system than yours. What is your problem? I'd say, I don't have an answer. So I was there, I remember the reaction, and I wrote about it, and I said, this is just delusional. Putin or Medvedev is going to eat their lunch. And if you look at what's happened on the global stage, Putin has bested the United States uh, for the last eight years at almost every turn. And it's not can you can you explain to our, your re, your listeners and and viewers what you mean by what did the Obama administration at that speech in Prague mean by a reset in, in in with Russia? What was the policy before, and what was their intention with the reset? And and then explain why the briefly you yeah. know in a few sentences why why that never happened. Well, first of all, what what was happening is Obama said he was going to rid the world of nuclear weapons. That's never going to happen, okay? Secondly, he said he's going to reduce the number of nukes. The thing is, all the Czechs knew and the Europeans, because the Russians had made sure the world knew, that, okay, we'll reduce the number of weapons, but each upgraded missile will be more powerful. And Russia just recently tested their Satan II missile, which one single missile has the ability to destroy an area the size of France or Texas, your choice. So yeah, you might have a total number of warheads reduced, but each warhead is bigger and more powerful. And everybody knew, because this was after the uh, brief war in, with Georgia, that 
Medvedev may be the face of Russia, but Putin is still really calling the shots. He's not. What, but what did, what did Obama mean by reset? Reset from what to what? Oh, what did he mean? That and we, why did he get such a bad reaction by the Czechs? Yeah, because they didn't believe that things were going to be ducky with Russia. They didn't believe that things were going to be better. They didn't believe they were going to be closer. They felt that Russia is Russia. As long it's it's too soon after communism for them to grow out of their siege mentality. And right. let's be honest. Let's be honest. The United States does have a double standard. We can co we can say, yeah, Ukraine, you can be part of NATO, and we'll put our army right up against Russia's border, and then we wonder why Russia has a problem with that. I'll tell you, I met many Georgians and Ukrainians, people from those no uh, no uh, the areas sandwiched in between the two superpowers, the no man's land countries, and I feel really bad for them because they're just tired of being interfered with by right. the other countries, and I don't blame them. Uh, so. I can see both sides up to a point, but to paint it like it's sugar and sweetness and right. we, we've got this, that to me was so naive. It's like, you know you have to be lying. Do you think you were that stupid? And that's, that's why I use blunt language. When he said you could keep your health plan, I got people today even telling me he didn't lie. He just didn't explain it clearly. Bullshit, he lied over 30 times. Well, I actually looked really closely at that issue and and um, and it it tur I think that it, it you know I I don't know whether he lied but definitely people on his staff knew it wasn't true. The question is he's so smart that it's very possible. I, I looked at this really closely because I saw this happen close up, and I began. I, I I when that and when that was exposed as a as a, as a falsehood the people were losing their plans and you know that it was a real choice and all this stuff I I I look really closely at you know the internal the, there was good reporting about this issue and I still didn't know whether Obama lied but the, the minute Obama in other words it was so archaic Kane and is buried in the rules of HHS and different different people were writing rulemaking that were indicating that in fact nuances that were buried in the documentation that was prepared for the speeches indicated that some people could under circumstance certain circumstances lose would not have the you can keep the plan if you want it now and. The question is whether Obama was personally briefed on that. I'd say, given that we know that he's an intelligent man and understands policy, it's probably true. But I, I'm not sure whether he actually knew he was lying. But he was clearly wrong. And people inside the administration knew that it was untrue. And I think what happened here is a parallel to what happened on Wall Street. Which is, I, which is, I have to go back and look at my uh, correspondence with different journalists and so on, where I was not in a position to do a lot of reporting on myself, but I was contacting. I think what happened, like one of the things that happened after the Wall Street crash is the, all the Wall Street reporters, reporters who covered it said, oh, everybody knew that the rating agencies were in the tank with the investment banks and would uh, give them these phony ratings. Well, no, not everybody knew and you didn't report it. And similarly, I think this, this, the, the, what the Democrats were telling you, oh, well, it was, you know, it was known. And, no, these nuances were not known. The reporters who should have been covering it were either not, were either not getting the or if they knew it, were sort of protecting Obama by not exposing the weaknesses of the program before it got, which was enacted and launched. So uh, I'm just saying that, yes, the administration lied, and it's probable Obama lied, but I'm not sure that he did. But the upshot was the American public was misled, and it's valuable for you to point this out. Well, okay, so to sum this up, you've got a failure of leadership to use the bully pulpit. I've said that clearly. You've said it. Other people have said it. 
a great communicator who didn't use his skills as he should have once he wins the big chair in the White House. Rahm Emanuel, the moment I heard he was going to be chief of staff, I'm like, wow, this guy, you know, th let's be honest, the way he talks, he could be a, a Trump speechwriter. He's not a right. unifying figure. And then you had this bitterness from the Clintonites who were holdovers that were still stunned that they didn't win. And so what I loved when I was younger as the Democratic Party, by the time Obama took power, in my opinion, was no longer the Democratic Party. And that's why I just refused to support, I, I would never support McCain, hello. And then Obama was like, he's going to be, he's not going to deliver on the goods. This is Trump change. And it's due to many different reasons. And I, so, so, so in your view, you did you abstain from voting? Uh, are you are you st you have the right to vote as an American even though you're overseas? I, I do, but I've got limitations. For example, I don't have state representation, so I can't. Some states allow you to write in a blank name. Forty-two out of fifty states do. I don't have a home state, so I can't do that. So this election, I'll tell everyone I've made this clear. I'm sitting it out for one reason. I don't support either candidate. I think. All the problems we have are blamed squarely on the Republicans and the Democrats because they're the only two parties that have been in power. Depends on the issue, depends on the degree. Some of it, it's all Republicans, some it's all Democrats, some of it's both. We need a viable third party alternative. I supported Sanders. On principle, I can't support Hillary Clinton because I don't think the Democratic Party ran a fair, square, straight up contest. We're still sorting the damage from that. I sure as hell can't support Trump. So because I can't sit there and fill in none of the above or whatever, I'm sitting this out on principle. I, if, if, I, I, I'm not a my party right or wrong type guy, I never have been. I've always looked at the individual politician. Now I'll tell you, if I lived in the United States and I had to choose between one or the other, absolutely I'd vote for Hillary. Absolutely. No question. Well, my view is that he is a clear, I agree. See, see, here's the thing is I agree with you that what happened with the Democratic Party started with Clinton. Um, it's, a, it's pretty complicated. My friend Tim No has written a book about inco income inequality. And there's other really good uh, books about the people writing about income inequality and using that as a lens to look at what happened to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And what happened is the Democratic Party realized um, uh, uh, so realized that they that they needed to be not seen as so anti-business and they needed all the money that corporations could give them so they wouldn't be outgunned. Um, so one of the things that I'm with a magazine that helped sort of create the centrism of the Republican Party, but wasn't pro-corporation. In other words, the Washington Monthly was a very, it's still a very small magazine with maybe 30, 40,000 readers, but lots of journalists read it and lots of academics and, and policymakers. And it made the case that uh, sort of the, uh, the election of Jimmy Carter and the election of Bill Clinton occurred in part because of the centrism that was uh, driven by the monthly, but then there was a downside that wasn't part of the monthly's agenda. Um, and so what I'm getting at is that I'm giving re your listeners some background here. So basically, the, the biggest thing that happened was Democrats, and this is a, a, a Tim Noah's book is the book to read on this, um, and he really explained um, uh, his book on inequality is called um, uh, The Great Divergence, and it's really worth reading. Gr uh, America's Growing Inequality Crisis and What We Can uh, Do About It, and so on. The importance of this is that what happened is, is that the Democrats basically went in whole hog for corporate money, um, and because that's what was needed to win, and they were being outgunned on that front, but they still had to keep some semblance of being liberal and progressive because their base, is, their base were minorities, the teachers union, and um, 
you know, used to be regular, normal unions, but, but unions became less and less important to American political life. And as unions weakened, the Democratic Party did not stand up for unions and allowed them to be undermined at the state level, didn't fight back on right to work laws, which means no, you didn't have to have union selection. Unions were weakened, and when unions are now, I think unions in terms of the private sector, only about maybe five to seven percent of all workers in America are now unionized and in the 40s and 50s and 60s it was like you know over you know over you know near 50 or over 50 percent it was very very high now it's virtually nothing and the largest number of unions members are in the uh, public public um, the public sector not the private sector so the upshot is unions are weakened and of course there's corrupt unions and so on. I agree with all that. So the weakening of the unions and the refusal of the Democrats, in other words, Democrats were looking short term. Where do we get the most money to beat back Republicans and their propaganda against us as being weak on defense, being broke crime and being anti-religion and being stuck up McGovern-esque liberals, okay? That was like the messaging that was wiping out Democrats. And they said, well, we've got to have some money of our own to beat back these people, and trial lawyers weren't enough. And the trial lawyers had been the backbone of their, at some, and then and since the 90s, Silicon Valley, okay? But they didn't have the, they were completely outgunned. And they decided to go whole hog in, let's sell out, let's sell out to Wall Street and corporate interests. And unfortunately, you had Democrats and guys like Rubin and all these people who kind of bought into these things and helped shape the Clinton era, which was, you know, was, you know, the centrist things that had an upside, which was it, it helped strengthen public image of Democrats in, in wanting to make, to end some of the abuses of reform, of welfare, wanting to have a stronger emphasis on policing when people were concerned about crime, but then they did all these other terrible things, <laughs> you know, which included the, um, you know, which is now affecting us in the over-incarceration, the whole, uh, you know, helping drive three strikes and you were out, penalties for felonies and, and, and much higher penalties of imprisonment if he used solid crack cocaine as opposed to white people used powdered cocaine. So there's, I, I know I'm wandering a bit. What I'm getting at is there were loads of sellouts by the Democrats uh, that were unfortunate that have, that legitimately allowed you to make your criticism of the Democratic Party. However, it's been my view the Republican Party, regardless of the sellouts of the Democrats, are so bad on so many fronts. It's not like the Democratic Party of 40 years ago where you had sensible people or like Jack Kemp who cared about poverty or Jacob Javits or liberal Democrats, who liberal Republicans or moderate Republicans who understood the importance of business, were pro-entrepreneurship, wanted some deregulation, some lesser taxes, but now you had this extreme anti-government forces that took over that were also fueled by uh, the Richard Nixon-derived Southern majority, let's play to racism in America. And so Republicans then, with the Tea Party revolt, uh, that had its strong racist elements is now completely a destructive anti-government uh, organization. It has no interest in legitimate governing except for loosening up the tax code and subsidies to give to big business. It has no other interests uh, except, of course, limiting uh, sexual freedom and abortion rights. But that's all it's about. It's not interested in governing. 
Dwight Eisenhower and even Richard Nixon would be viewed as extreme communists in today's Republican Party. Same with Ronald Reagan. He would be considered Ronald a liberal. Reagan would be too on immigration and other stuff. Yeah. However, Ronald created Ron, see, here's what I, I, Ronald Reagan did create, you know, government, you know, uh, what, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen to you is if the government shows up at your door and says, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Or his, 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 his point of view that government isn't the solution, government is the problem. And it is important to remember that Ronald Reagan launched his presidential campaign in the primary in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Why did he pick Philadelphia, Mississippi? That's where white Southerners killed Schwerner Ray and Goodman in the Civil Rights era and is considered like a bastion of white civil rights, white state rights. And he used coded language about states' rights in his opening his opening bid for the nomination. Well, what is signal does that send to all those uh, all those uh, white Southerners who aren't yet part of the Democratic Party? Uh, you know that this guy is one of us, and 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 so it's important to remember that while he was genial and reasonable. He helped. We, there's no way to to downplay his importance on creating peace. You may think it was a sellout with the Soviet Union. I mean, but and tearing and his role in getting the award, you know, the wall torn down. And he was very reasonable on immigration. And he was actually personally tolerant of gays and was maybe the first major Republican leader to signal tolerance of gays. However, on many other fronts, and particularly AIDS, tax policy that's pro-business, and signaling that racism was okay, he was terrible, you know? And there were a lot of savage cuts of social services. So it's a mixed bag for Reagan. But Ronald Reagan, you were correct. If you took the full agenda of Ronald Reagan circa, you know, the 80s, and he ran, he could not win in today's Republican prime party. You're absolutely right. And that this is why the Republicans have gone from being intolerable to being, I personally can't wait until they go the way of the dinosaur. Because the sooner that the Republican party as it stands today is out of business, as far as I'm concerned, that's the sooner that America can get back to the business it should be tending to. We've got to take a break. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. My guest is Art Levine, one of the top investigative journalists and reporters in the United States, and that's my honest opinion. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the second part of the Cal Corf TV show. My name is Cal Corf here on Daily World Television, and I'm your host, of course. With me is very special guest from the United States, ace investigative journalist and reporter, veteran Art Levine. We're talking about politics, of course, because on the CalCorp TV show, here on Daily World TV, we cover everything from politics to the paranormal. And of course, we have coming up on Tuesday, November 8th, the most important election in the world, arguably. It is the final day to vote in the US presidential election. People will either choose Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And one of these two people, barring an unforeseen mess, will be the next president of the United States and the so-called free world, as Americans love to say, for better or for worse. Now, Art, I know you're a walking encyclopedia of this stuff. Um, before we get back to Donald Trump and, in our view, what a disaster he would be, what America does not need to be their next president, is there a set of resources online that you would recommend that people can go to so that they can separate the signal from the noise and understand all of this stuff? Yeah, I think uh, there's a few that are very are, are pretty valuable uh, to think about. And in terms of what um, uh, Brad Friedman has something called Brad Blog that covers in the most depth issues related to uh, election integrity, fairness. He's a progressive who's followed for 
well more than a decade before I started doing this in 2006. He was covering it even earlier. Problems having to do with GOP vote suppression, vulnerability of machines. He he he's a liberal, but he calls it as he sees it, and and it's very useful. It's called Bradblog.com, and he also is a daily broadcaster on the Pacifica Network that is streaming to anyone who has a computer. You can just go to Brad Blog and his daily show, where he has very interesting guests and experts. And that's where I go. Uh, in addition to follow uh, the issues of vote suppression and so on, the other key people are Michael Wines of the New York Times and Ari Berman of The Nation. It's always good to check in with Ari Berman. Now, I'm going to mention a website that is really sort of one-stop shopping for political junkies in a way that others are not. And it's called Memo Random. And M E M E M E O R A N D U M dot com. And what it does, it has some kind of unique algorithm that allows it to take breaking news on politics and then place it pretty quickly on its front page, but then offers, in addition to the breaking news underneath it, it offers um, uh, commentary by pundits across the political spectrum. So in one place, you can um, uh, you can get uh, news, and then they also have so what the left part of the screen is called top items. Like so, one of the top items is now from Politico called Hillary Clinton sent Chelsea info now deemed classified. Okay, and that's that broke just a little while ago, and then underneath it are already all the people talking about it from right wing to left wing point of views. Now, and then on the very, on the right part of the screen is something called a uh, new item finder, which is like even more recent material, uh, so on. So for instance, uh, the woman who accused Trump of raping her at 13 just dropped her lawsuit, you know, and, and so on. So it's a very good site to kind of check in. And then when it comes to polling, the two blessed, if you really uh, want to keep up on the different polling and polling interpretations, and there's a lot of division of opinion among pollsters just how narrow the lead is, and w w is Trump actually ahead in, say, Florida, Ohio? It's very, there's a lot of different polling, and then some people try to aggregate and analyze. And the two best aggregators and analyzers is the website 538, which is spelled out, which is Nate Silver, who earned his reputation because of picking literally every state correctly, you know, for the last recent elections, but he got Trump wrong, okay? And he, he provide, he got the Trump success and winning of the primary at least in the early stages, quite wrong, and he kind of had a man culpa, but he has a very sophisticated assessment. And then the other, which is a very good aggregation of, of, of the most important political news and original reporting, but also they have something called the Real Clear Politics Election 2016. And it's, so that website is realclearpolitics.com, and so right now, for instance, the re Real Clear pol Politics poll average has Clinton up 1.6 uh, spread across the, the, the country. But then when you go to certain of the um, uh, swing states, it'll give you the Real Clear Politics average of different state polls. And in Florida, Clinton is up 1.2%. And Trump is under the real clear politics average. So that's their aggregation is Trump is up 3.3% in Ohio. And, you know, 3% to 4% is the margin of error. So in a number of these swing states, uh, I, I, you know, so the number of the swing states, the margin of error, they're less than 3%. Uh, in key swing states about which side is ahead, and that's why the issues of vote suppression and turnout become so critical. 
All right, let, let's talk about that for a moment because you raised an excellent point, but let me kind of segue into it. In the sure. first part of this show, we talked about what a disaster Donald Trump would be. We've talked about how the genesis of his candidacy has kind of materialized. There's enormous polarization and dissatisfaction among the American people. The hope and change that people were promised that the Obama campaign ran on, plus stuff that existed that has nothing to do with Obama, have seen to have jailed and coalesced and are exploited and epitomized in a candidate like Trump, who is, I think we would agree, unlike anything America has ever seen before. Now, there's issues where the same polarization is claiming that the system is rigged. You know, they've already got their excuse in case Trump loses, that uh, it, it, there's cheating everywhere, the media is in cahoots, and while there is bias in the media, I've seen it myself, and then there's the issue of very real uh, suppression of the vote systematically undertaken, just as cynically calculated by the Republicans, the way they do their selective gerrymanding, and then you've got a issue of voter fraud, which on the other extreme end, people are saying it doesn't exist at all, even though that's not true, but there's a difference between voter fraud and voter suppression. Now on the issue of voter suppression and voter fraud, how do you compare and contrast the two issues? What is more important and what is more of a threat to American democracy? Well, here's the thing is, vote suppression is so much more a real a threat then, um, and vote suppression, it, it's hard to quantify, but it's very real. So in, in states like, um, in states like uh, North Carolina, uh, tens of thousands of black voters have been struck from the rolls, okay? They've been struck from the voting rolls in at least three counties. And how did this come about? And so there's been some analysis. I've been following vote suppression since 2006 when I wrote an article for Salon, the six worst states, and they included Ohio and Florida. And basically what's happening that's important to understand is vote suppression has denied probably in the hundreds of thousands, if not a few million, if you look at the total level of obstacles, which includes making it difficult to apply, but really concrete disenfranchisement is part of the Republican strategy, and they created this myth of voter fraud. So in terms of the myth of voter fraud, one of the things to understand about it is, like here's an example about voter fraud. So the reality of it is, is that uh, there's been so few uh, incidents. There was one um, studies by academics and uh, independent newspapers have found, for instance, that out of, um, uh, here's an example, between out of one billion ballots, okay, uh, between 2000 and 2014 cast, there were 34 credible instances of people impersonating, impersonating, it was done by uh, Justin Levin uh, of Loyola uh, Law School and other experts. They were looking at the issue and that's what they, so you need to understand, one billion ballots over a 14 year period, literally 31 people attempted to impersonate another voter. Now, what you hear from the Trump campaign, and you've heard from Republicans for 30 years, that was not effectively challenged by Democrats. This is one of the examples of where Republicans are so much better at messaging and exploiting people's emotions than Democrats. I've used this analogy for years. Uh, back when uh, uh, Michael Jordan was the king of basketball, but you can apply it now for LeBron James. When it comes to messaging and, 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 and exploiting the emotions of the American public, the 
uh, the uh, Republicans are like LeBron James at the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Democrats are like a pickup junior high school team. That's the difference. The level of skill, expertise, is so much greater. And now it's been joined by the ability to get their right-wing talking points, including voter fraud, introduced into mainstream journalism because of the limits of mainstream journalism, which can't, which feel it can't, it can't call out um, absolute lies and fraud. It goes on the one hand this, on the one hand that. Now, the only, the only thing in which. The uh, mainstream journalists are willing to say your side is making up lies is the Holocaust and Holocaust deniers. I'm using that extreme example, but that's about it. Everything else is treated as, and I'm mentioning these issues because it helps understand why most Americans, now the latest poll showed that not just Republicans, about over 60%, 70% of the American public now believe that the election will be rigged. And when, the, when people use the word rigged, they're generally thinking in terms of the Republican framing of the word rigged, which means that, uh, that there'll be millions, and this is terms that Trump has used, so, for instance, Trump has cited a study by the Pew Institute that showed that there were like two million dead people on the rolls, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, that, so when you hear that, you go, well, that's the Pew Research Foundation. They're not in the tank with the Republicans. So this must, so, but that study did not conclude that two million people ended up, or even thousands of people ended up uh, voting fake. It's because of this, the lack of resources and the ineptness of the state government and keeping up to date their voting rolls, which are when, and those voter registration rolls, when in the hands of Republicans, end up purging the, those same databases. So let's, let's understand what's happening politically. You have Donald Trump successfully echoing and repeating and amplifying a 40-year-old message of the Republican Party. Massive voter fraud done by illegal immigrants and, and, where, and, and also people who don't have appropriate ID, and we need ID, okay? I followed this really closely. So what's happened in North Carolina is they have... So they've updated, uh, there's so many different ways the vote can be suppressed. So just to repeat, there's almost no real voter fraud as identified Republicans and message for 40 years, but most people don't know it. As the um, uh, Brennan Institute, which is progressively oriented but nonpartisan, said you have more of a chance of being struck by lightning, then you way more of a chance, significantly more chance being struck by lightning, walking outside, than there is of someone going up in today's at, at falsifying and getting a vote. Just even one person. Now, the claims by Republicans and Trump, echoed by right wing media, and treated as legitimate claims that ought, that have differing views by mainstream media is millions of people, tens of thousands of people are regularly being encouraged, as Trump said, in Philadelphia and other cities to go in and improperly vote and fal falsify. So that's the message. And what does that lead to? That voter fraud message Okay, led to these very restrictive ID laws, and what occur and and it's beyond just ID laws. The polling places are moved away, so you have purging of roll. So let me explain the many different ways that the votes can be repressed, and it's important to understand this 
because it's not just ID. Uh, but the ID is sort of the best known, and sometimes uh, the laws are so extreme that uh, the ID laws and what occurs in the lawsuits is the people actually have said publicly, Republican officials have said publicly, and or emails show up as a result of depositions and lawsuits where Republican officials are quoted as saying, yes, this will keep down the black vote. Yes, we are repressing the vote, okay? So they actually have evidence of them admitting that. And a good example of that is when they're actually sworn underneath oath. For instance, in Wisconsin, when the ID law in Wisconsin was challenged, I believe it was, no, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, where the ID law was successfully struck down on paper, but not in practice, which I will explain to you. It's very important to understand it. So if you read a headline that says, law struck down, that does not mean that the law is not actually being carried out in a de facto way. It's like saying Supreme Court ended segregation in 1954. Could you walk into a schoolhouse or a lunch counter if you were black in 1954 and not be stopped? No, it meant nothing. Because there was, so you need to understand anything you see about a court ruling has in fact very little practical impact if a Republican office holders are dominating the state government levers of power or the county election board. So in this context, the Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, when they lost the lawsuit, Pennsylvania election officials had to admit on the stand under oath, under penalty of perjury, that they had not found a single case of voter impersonation in their state in the last like 10 to 20 years. Now, that law passed the Pennsylvania legislature because Republicans were arguing that there were thousands and thousands of dead people voting and thousands of illegal immigrants. And yet when they were put on the stand, the, the actual election officials had to admit, no, we have not found a single case. Now, that's what's going on. And now it's being extended to taking away the polling places that used to be near a campus. Mm -hmm. They're now being moved a half hour, 20 minutes, a half hour off campus to make it harder for kids and students who don't have cars to get there. If you're stuck in rural Wisconsin, you don't have a car, and you're in universe, or let's say you're in Madison, and the and it's like in the it's in the outside the very far edges of the county of Madison, or in Duke University. Okay, so Duke, I believe, is in Raleigh, North Carolina. So at Duke University, the polling place that used to be right near the campus where students were vote is now a half hour away. You can't walk out on the campus and walk a few blocks to vote. So that means, oh, guess what? All those liberal students who might want to stop a racist warmonger from becoming president and destroying the climate and the world, they won't have an equal opportunity to vote with all the hundreds and hundreds of precincts available to rich, middle class, and working class whites in North Carolina. Well, that's not even good enough to take away the precinct houses away from inner cities. They have to stop the early voting. And there's, in the lawsuits, they've admitted, we're stopping early voting on Sundays because that's when black people vote early, you know, encouraged to do so and organize through their churches or whatever. And they actually say, we can't have blacks voting on Sunday. We have to cut that off. That's in the record of the lawsuits. So in North Carolina, a 100-year-old black woman who's voted in every election since women were, nearly since women were allowed to vote, 
Okay, 20. She's voted in every election since the 1930s. You know, when, or when she was able to. Certainly since the 60s when she got the right to vote as a black person in North Carolina. She was purged from the rolls. Now, how did that happen? How did it happen that tens of thousands of black people all across one state in three counties are not on the vote rolls, even though they voted for Obama in 2012. How did it happen? Very simple. North Carolina has laws that take advantage of a strategy known as caging that's been around for about 40 years. And caging means you sort of, what you do is in Carolina, North Carolina is particularly liberal, any citizen can challenge any other citizen, i.e. black people and students, from voting by simply sending a letter to whatever was their last previous envelope address. And if that letter is returned, they can walk in to the Board of Elections and say, strike this person from the rolls. And then, the, the, then they're all in cahoots. Okay, so they walk into the Board of Elections in the white dominated uh, counties or where white uh, election holdovers have influence. And then the white guys go, well, they may or may not follow the effort to notify them. So what is the quote effort to notify them? Sending a mail from the election board itself to the same address that's no longer valid. And if it's not forwarded, then nobody is notified. And who? And in the real world, they're not bothering to do so. So that means Republican operatives come in with piles and piles of return letters that they sent and say, strike them from the rolls. And they do so. And what happened in North Carolina is this action was in theory stopped by a um, by a judge. And by the way, the other person to follow on vote suppression in terms of summarizing it very well is Rachel Maddow's show. And even if you don't get MSNBC, it's available on podcast form through Stitcher, iTunes, and as a uh, premium app through uh, through um, through um, uh, you can get live MS and MSNBC and CNN through. Uh, an app called TuneIn. So she's covered these issues too. So here's what happened. A judge declared that these practices and the notion that any citizen, so a member of the Ku Klux Klan with a hood over his head holding a burning cross can walk into, that is, let's say snuffed out for fire reasons, can walk in to any election board in North Carolina, an absolutely critical swing state that Trump must win if he's going to win the election. It's very critical. So they, a Ku Klux Klan member in full regalia can walk in with hundreds and hundreds of returned envelopes, walk over to his fellow white racist election official and say, strike these people from the rolls, and they press a button and they're deleted. Now, a judge like this week said this was, quote, insane and was something that would have happened in 1901. And so he issued a emergency order stopping those purges. It doesn't necessarily mean that the thousands that have already been deleted will get their rights back. So many people reading the news will think, oh, this is great. The courts have stepped in, just like in the good old days when you know, LBJ and JFK and Democratic judges that were noble stepped in to prevent abuses, not anymore. And the most important article to read, read on this is um, a very valuable article by Michael Wines of the New York Times that in itself, the headline's almost misleading, but it says, as ID laws fall, voters see new barriers rise. But what this story is really telling is how essentially across the South, 
the Midwest and any Republican stronghold from the county level up to the state is engaged in massive nullification. Like there used to be white jury nullification. You'd have a white guy with a gun, bloody gun in his hand and two dead black people. Uh, he had killed civil rights workers and the juries wouldn't convict. That's what's happening now in America. And let me just tell you how it's happening. So in Wisconsin, in July, a federal court validated much of Wisconsin's restrictive election law, concluding that it discriminated against minorities by requiring voters to produce photo identification cards that blacks and Latinos too often lack. The revenue was straightforward. Henceforth, the state was to promptly issue a credential valid as a voting ID to any person who applied for one. Oh, that's nice. Well, what actually happens? So this month, a woman named Treasure Collins, uh, well, in October, visited one of the Wisconsin Motor Vehicle Offices. This is Wisconsin. That's a liberal state that issued IDs, and she found something entirely different. Quote, I brought everything my mom told me I would need, my school ID, a copy of my birth certificate, my social security number, said 18-year-old Miss Collins, wanting to vote for the first time. Quote, but they told me I needed an original copy of my birth certificate, an original copy all the way from Illinois. Okay, so what does that mean? Out of ignorance or racism, but the effect is the same, the state arms of following court orders are ignoring them. So that is what is at stake here. We have massive civil disobedience by state election boards and state governors and Republican legislatures over limiting the, in, in carrying out court orders, limiting it. However, the, even this discussion is too narrow because what's happened is over 20 states since 2010 have passed restrictive ID laws and other restrictions pa uh, limiting voting through limiting early voting, all sorts of other things that were designed as they were describing it in North Carolina, surgically designed to eliminate black voters, okay? Most other 20, over 20 states have such laws still on the books that have not been struck down. And why they haven't been struck down is two reasons. And these are, this sounds like it's nuanced, but if Donald Trump becomes president, these are the reasons. So it's worth your listeners understanding what might sound like Arcania that is pretty critical. One is Supreme Court a few years ago upheld an Indiana voting ID law, okay, which said that the photo ID law was fine, and this was a uh, this was a Bush appointed Supreme Court. Uh, that found these laws were fine and legitimate. I happen to know as a journalist that that civil rights lawyers and national democratic experts on voter ID pleaded backstage for the Democratic Party in Indiana not to challenge the law because they knew the court would struck it down. But egomaniacal, showboating Democrats who may also have been inflamed by notions of justice, went ahead and launched the short-to-be-defeated appeal of the law. What the, what the sensible people were saying is, please don't go to the Supreme Court because some federal courts, if you don't go to the Supreme Court, will, will strike down the ID laws where they exist and others will uphold them. But if you appeal to the Supreme Court, we're going to lose and every state and country will be able to pass restrictive laws. And that's what sort of happened. So in the midterm election, at, when Republicans in the revolt, when the nation sort of turned over against Obama in, in 2010, 
and all these state houses lost, and all these things happened, you see, to kind of weaken the democratic hold on state governments, they began passing these laws. Well, there was bulwark that existed, okay, that would have prevented the worst of the worst laws being implemented. What was that bill of war? That was the 1965 Civil Rights Act, that Voting Rights Act, that created something very important that's existed, protections that have existed for, you know, 50, 60 years, I'm terrible at math, since the mid-60s, okay? And it said that if a state had an historic pattern of discrimination, which essentially was every southern state and all southwestern states, okay? If they had an historic pattern of discrimination, any change in their laws or regulations for voting would have to be reviewed by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. So that was the backstop, the firewall against total disenfranchisement of all blacks and Hispanics in the Southwest and in the South. That firewall was removed when Congress, when the Supreme Court successfully agreed, the Bush supported Supreme Court, still majority Bush people. Now that was, it was a decision reached under Obama, but it was still very influenced by conservative views. This just happened like two years ago. I'm not sure it could have been 2013 or 2014, but essentially the Supreme Court gutted a, I think it was Title II, but a key provision that allowed for this judicial review. Because a bigoted Southern state appealed the Supreme Court decision saying this was an onerous burden. We are very fair to our black citizens. Why are we under this yoke? And what happened is the Supreme Court agreed. So what was going on in all of these states, they literally had written new laws. I am not kidding. And, and Ari Berman in his books and others described it. So they, so uh, the innocent sounding Southern state goes to the Supreme Court and says, oh, this is such an onerous regulatory burden. Look at our good faith and cause a because of the previously enforced law, blacks were in fact allowed to vote in fairly equal numbers. So they say, why do we need this horrible legacy from the bad old days of racist South in the 60s? We're not like that anymore. And the Supreme Court agreed. So what happened? While it's pending, legislators in these southern states had were drafting new restrictive laws. And literally, the moment it was announced, I am not kidding, the moment the Supreme Court announced the gutting of the Civil Rights Act, these new laws were introduced. And that's what we're facing right now in North Carolina, in Wisconsin, and other issues. Some of these were... Wisconsin, but it wouldn't affect Wisconsin because it didn't have a history of discrimination. But all these southern states and all these southwestern states, like New Mexico and Arizona, which could in fact be in play, obviously North Carolina is in play, different states that are critical to a Trump victory or Hillary victory, you're not getting the full level of fair turnout by students, by blacks, and Hispanics. So you've seen articles maybe, oh, the downturn in black voting is people aren't as enthusiastic about Hillary as they were about Obama. Of course that's true. There's going to be some downturn in voting, but not the level that you're seeing right now. Why is that? Because you have vote oppression laws in effect now that will worsen by this uh, Supreme Court ruling. What you just described is something that even Hollywood would be hard pressed to make up. If somebody saw this in a Hollywood movie, they'd say America doesn't work that way, but yet it does. Or you could say it doesn't work like it should. Now, right. is, is there any effort underway to take it back to the Supreme Court, point out real case studies and say, hey, look at this. You can't deny it. 
This is what's happened because you guys blew it the previous time that this was before you. Well, I don't, right now, well, we have a vacancy on the Supreme Court, and so anything that's really controversial would be divided. And if Hillary became president and the Republican state contained the connection of the Senate, then that won't happen because she may not even be able to get her, her um, unless they change the filibuster rules. What I'm getting at is I don't think that the uh, until Hillary or a Democrat gets to a point so it's a majority liberal, it's a clear majority liberal court, they, nobody would go back on that. And then you have the issue um, which, uh, so then you have the issue of the vulnerability of the voting machines. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, the vol and, and, and it's important to understand that both right wing and left wing people raise these issues and they have legitimate reasons to be alarmed about the vulnerability and the lack of, of, of security uh, of these machines. That doesn't mean that they're being actively rigged by people inside the election bureaus, but they're so badly done. And so, for instance, one of the problems is the Brennan Center study uh, recently, just this year, examined America's voting machines and that 42 states use machines that are at least 10 years old. Uh, but and more than that, two thirds of America's voters are voting on machines that are touch screen and whether or not there's some little paper trail that's printed out have no valid way of confirming the accuracy of it. And uh, it may be that maybe, I'm, maybe that's a little wrong and may, there's more use of optical scan and those can be hacked too. So there's, uh, Brad has done some of the, um, has done some of the uh, most important work aggregating the news on that. However, the reality of it is, is that we have vulnerable systems and now NBC News is reporting that U.S. intelligence services are worried, uh, given the hacking skills, they are worried that there could very well be a, um, another, another, uh, another uh, kind of hacking attack of which this denial of service that brought in um, the denial of service that brought down all these major websites like Twitter and Reddit and others, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, that that kind of attack could go on against American, um, American voting systems or there's a number, so there's a number of very alarming developments that might happen and, and the, 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 the reporting on it shows that intelligence agencies are worried. They say they're more worried about possible blackouts or power outages that might be manipulated and most worried about uh, false information that gets, that gets leaked, you know, leaked fake emails and leaked stories at the last minute that get, you know, that are critical of Hillary because it's likely coming from Russia fake stuff, not even read leaked emails, just fake stuff that fuels all of the fears and won't, won't be able to be responded to. However, the reality of it is these machines have been vulnerable to both hacking and mistakes. So at a more, even just at a more moderate level, uh, at just a more moderate level, there's, there's reports of vote flipping that have gone on in, uh, if you go, for instance, to the Brennan Center uh, website uh, or look for uh, issues relating to vote flipping, you'll see examples where votes, uh, vote flipping, ha as they point out, vote flipping happens, but it doesn't mean the election is rigged. Now, in a, this kind of election, Go ahead. Right. Uh, I will turn that off. I'm sorry. It's okay. That would that so basically uh, that so the notion that rigging could take place is true. It could take place, but more likely is just a lot of failures. 
So for instance, um, there have been reports that, you know, uh, and they've been played up by the right or then the left about vote flipping, where, you know, people in Texas were complaining about vote flipping and all that. Now, the reality of it is, is that it's unlike a hack for that reason, but it could happen. And, and, and there have been errors where votes are lost. And so we, in a very tight election, we can't have full and fair faith in the, in the, um, in the voting process. And so to that degree, Trump's messaging of that it's, quote, rigged, while that's not true in the way he means it, there is reasons for doubt. And what's happening is legitimate reasons for doubting. And to me, the, there are, when it comes to machines, two legitimate reasons for doubting. You have uh, a, a significant number of states have really out-of-date machines, kind of like if you were, what was the first computer you used to, growing up, if that was what was used now on your desktop. Stuff that's literally 15 to 20 years old, okay? Really old stuff that is easily failed and crashing, that's existing. And then you have the built-in lack of knowledge of what voters really intended, which could be viewed as an elect electronic version of the hanging Chad controversy, where you have these touchscreen machines which a majority of Americans vote on. Now, what's happened is there's been a, um, I would say a distraction or a faint, F-E-I-N-T, around the issue of paper trails. So a lot of the mainstream media coverage is, well, we have, and in Virginia, which is a really important state, the, the voting machines there don't even have these little tiny toilet paper thin printouts that are called paper trails. Now, the mainstream media coverage for those like the C Common Cause, advocacy groups and those echoing it, referred to having paper trails as really important for these DREs. But the problem is twofold, and this is stuff I've learned from Brad's excellent aggregation of you know, state election officials reports and, and independent news accounts, is the following. One, and there's a study at Brown University that show this, no, almost no voters ever look at this little tiny printout. You gotta understand, you touch the screen, a majority of Americans touch the screen. Uh, let's say even a majority of those machines have a tiny printout. Many don't. Most, most touch screen of Virginia and many in Pennsylvania. Two critical states don't have that. But even if they do have it, so it spits out this little tiny, thin, paper thin roll, thinner than anything you'd see in any accounting machine. Okay, mm -hmm. can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. And then yes. what happened is, so it, it spits it out and very few voters look at it to see if it checks with their vote. So that's critical. So it's, People, most voters are busy. They they they'll see the screen will pop up that will show their vote result, and then you go, "Is this what you intended?" And you go, "Yes," and that's what it says on the screen. And there's a little tiny paper thing that'll print out. However, that doesn't mean and 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 Brad uh, uh, Bev Harris, who's on. Um, who's on uh, Brad's show today that can be streamed from Brad blog and also did a documentary about hacking for HBO that people can see here's probably on YouTube, demonstrated that even with that, you can still, you can still fake the results because even though it says that you voted there, the actual recording, the actual um, uh, internal uh, hardware device with the votes can be hacked. So the screen says one thing and what's inside the machine says something else. And she's demonstrated that with, you know, numerous times and that also has been demonstrated by independent computer experts at universities. And it's made worse because 
many, many voting machines have these wireless connections for convenience. So that means somebody could walk in, get some tip from an insider, and just sit there with a mobile phone or some kind of remote and reprogram stuff. Now that's within that's within the that's within the actual election counting. Uh, optical scans can also be hacked, where the the tabulation will could be rigged. I'm not saying it will be rigged, but they could be rigged through errors or glitch, glitches, you know, errors or deliberate, and and the data that comes out of each precinct could be erroneous from what people actually voted. But the advantage of an optical scan is you have an actual piece of paper with the actual hand marks of a real voter that can be looked at in the case of recounts. And then we get to other issues is, they're supposed to be um, sampling, met the state rules on audits and sampling of what actually happened is, in general, there's no looking back. <laughs> I know this sounds ridiculous, but it's my understanding that in most states, there's no actual mandatory sampling of, of the voting to determine that it was accurate. So there, the only way they can really know that it's accurate is if there's a piece of paper with the actual voter's intention marked. And then, you know, that's digitized, scanned, optical scan. But in most places, the only time that those papers were re-examined in a systematic way, it doesn't have to recount everything, but in a systematic way, is if a loser mounts a recount challenge. And in many states, and this is obviously going to be as a burden for congressmen in smaller states, could well be a burden on some Senate races, won't be a burden on a presidential race, to get a full recount where this stuff is analyzed carefully requires a lot of money. How, or, or, or if it's close enough as in Florida. So the reason, for instance, that there was a recount in Florida with Bush versus Gore is so close that it triggers an automatic recount. It was like 535 votes. So it varies across states, but in most states, if there was no recount, either triggered by narrowness, narrowness of a vote or a request for a recount by a losing candidate, the, the, the actual voting is not re-audited and re-examined in any meaningful way. The closest thing that's done is they will try to reconcile the data reported out of each individual precinct with what ends up uh, you know, at the central headquarters as the data reported out of each internal. But that doesn't allow you to actually check, is this what the voters actually intended? Now, there are reform suggestions that have been largely ignored to have more rigorous auditing and rechecks, even with the limitations of America's voting system, and those have largely not been implemented. So. That's where in a narrow, and now we have something that's very unusual because of Trump. What he's done is he's taken the blended natural conspiracy thinking through the Alex Jones, InfoWars, right-wing circles, and brought that mainstream and amplified what could be legitimate concerns over machines. He's more on the fake message of voter fraud, but essentially, there are legitimate concerns about the functionality and accuracy of voting machines, particularly touchscreen. He has amplified that and wrapped that in to one boiling mass of emotionally, uh, emotionally hot lava of extremism and fear about election rigging that is very effective if over 60% of, of the American public now believe that their votes will be rigged. I, uh, maybe it's a little lower, a little higher, but if you have a majority of Americans now believing, so that basically is 
Donald Trump, whether or not he's actively cooperating with Putin and their sharing of information with Putin intelligence and the Trump campaign, which is, you know, debatable, but there's allegations, whether or not he is actually colluding with Putin's intelligence team back channel, there's no doubt that this level of doubt about the election is precisely what Putin would love to see. And you know better than as, as probably anyone how Putin helped destabilize the Ukraine and other countries. And tell me what Putin did in other countries, because maybe that's what we can see in the United States in terms of casting doubt over elections, fomenting uh, discord and, and, and raising problems in, in, in the democratic process in other countries. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, we have to take a break, then we'll come back for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be back with Art Levine uh, talking and sharing his encyclopedia-type knowledge of what is a mess now in the United States, probably the most bizarre, convoluted, and at the same time, extremely important election in a long time in the history of the United States. We'll be right back. Okay, now Art, let's recap briefly because we've gone over a lot of material. As I've said before, you're a walking encyclopedia of this stuff, and I mean that in a complimentary manner. You've got an election that is unprecedented. It is way beyond anything in the history of the United States. The United States is 240 years old. You've got Donald Trump, whom we agree, and I think most objective people would agree, I don't know what else to call it, that for him to win and become president would be the worst thing that can happen to the country. There's many valid reasons for that. He's running against Hillary Clinton, and within their candidacy are very important messages. Hillary had a very close contest with Bernie Sanders, as you know, and that was unexpected. If you listen to the pundits, it was going to be another showdown between the Bushes and the Clintons. That's what the experts said. They were all wrong. The reason Sanders was so successful is because he struck a nerve with many Americans who are disillusioned. A lot of young people gravitated to him. Then you have Trump, who seems the epitome of the alt-right or alternative reality, which has built its legacy, in my opinion, as somebody who has exposed these uh, conspiracies over the decades. You know, you, you have a lot of suspicion. You know, most people still think uh, aliens crashed in Roswell in 1947. They think there was a grassy old gunman in Kennedy's murder, even though they don't remember who Kennedy was. So as famed physicist uh, Max Planck said, he said, new ideas come into being, not because people accept them, but because their opponents die and a new generation is born accustomed to them. So you're right, absolutely dead on that Trump and what he represents, his backers, have been exploiting this, which makes them cynical, calculating types, unworthy of the office of the President of the United States. You've got voter suppression, which I argue is treasonous against the country. You've got some instances of voter fraud. I believe we need a system where it ensures the integrity of the vote. But let's say we have the best voter ID laws in the world. As you have pointed out, and you, you won me over on this uh, argument, I was unaware of these details you went into, I've always been for a system that guarantees the integrity of the vote. Because I've seen it in other countries, and I'm like, why can't America do this? Same with health care. Why can't we do it in America? Right. Well, we can. We just don't bother for various reasons. You were spot on about how the Democrats meant well, but they messed it up. I've said for years that the Democrats are kind of like the Keystone Cops. They're perfectly capable of imploding. So you've got all these elements in play. And then you have both candidates who are the subject of an FBI investigation, as many as five if you're Hillary Clinton, and God knows what's going to happen with Trump. And now you've got other elements like the Russians supposedly involved, now you've got the Department of Homeland Security saying Al-Qaeda might have an Election Day surprise. This is on top of the usual stereotype of the October surprise. And you've got WikiLeaks out there, which wasn't such a factor in the last election. You put it all together, and you've got a script that even Hollywood would reject if you were a writer, their most brilliant screenwriter, and said, look at this script I got for you. They'd say, get out of here. Nobody will believe this movie. But yet it is real. And what's going to happen is yet to, to pan out. If the investigation with Hillary over Wiener's computer 
does find stuff against her, and and she's the president elect. You have a problem if Trump is convicted for basically running a scam university. You've got stuff against him, and well, that, that's just a civil suit. <laughs> yeah, a civil suit. But the point is, you've got you, you've got two candidates who are polarizing. You've got a country that's never been more divided. You've got candidates which are damaged goods no matter what happens. So no matter who wins, unless they run away within the next 48 hours, you're going to have a polarized country. And again, I predict, I'm saying it ahead of time like I did when Obama won the race the first time, that the Republicans, if you think they're the party of no now, they're going to be, they're going to make the current Republicans look like they're saints because they're absolutely going to go back and stick it to the Clintons and try to finish the job they didn't succeed in last time, which was impeachment. They'll try anything. So I, I, I think I think you're right. There's only one thing I disagree with you. You use the phrase some voter fraud. I think that 31, 34 examples of voter of credible voter impersonation uh, out of a billion votes cast over a 14 year period doesn't merit the word some. It was virtually none. Is I, a better term. I, I agree with those statistics, but let me tell you something I saw on the internet, and we can absolutely come back to this later. I googled a map of people in jail serving time for being convicted of voter fraud at various levels. There's over a thousand people in there, and I know that. Well, that's I think I think there's a difference between voter fraud and election fraud. Now, I happen to know. It's a little, it's convoluted, and again, um, Brad has done some of the best writing and thinking about this. Um, uh, uh, also, Steve Rosenfeld of Alternet, and then a lot of this news is best aggregated at votingnews.com, uh, which is by Verified Voting, if you, if you look at that website, ver uh, votingnews.com thevotingnews.com. But here's the thing is, there's definitely been a, I, I used to, I was a reporter at Miami for uh, 10 years, okay? Now Miami, you actually had um, uh, by a crooked, um, I think, you know, because almost all political leaders in, in Miami-Dade County uh, are Hispanic heritage. You had an Hispanic heritage mayor help organize some kind of election fraud where there wa wasn't impersonation so much as, well, I think it was ballot stuffing, equivalent of ballot stuffing and other means of rigging election done by an existing office holder to keep power and, so, and people went to jail for that. So you have examples throughout, and so I would, I'd like to see the, the, I hope you post on Facebook the source for this claim that there's a thousand people there for quote voting fraud. Um, I, I'd be very interested to see what what the actual shortages were, and and that's one of the problems is there's a conflating of election fraud, which is rare but does happen, which is insiders figure out ways to monk with the system or stuff ballots literally or electronically and that occasionally does happen. What almost never happens is an individual will show up, claim to be somebody else who he isn't or claim to be a dead person and who they don't know is dead because they're on the voting rolls and vote. That is what is so rare and that is the basis of all of these ID laws and all of these thousands of people who are being um, who are being uh, limited. You see what I'm saying? That, I, that, I, I do. And and, and um, I admit because I didn't uh, the way this website is, and I'll be happy to to send you the link. I assume it's still up. My position has been because I've seen it in other countries. The other countries who are not as developed as uh, America is seem to have figured out a way to ensure that everybody can vote. And right. in India, their, their logistics are much more complicated than America will be, just in the population of poverty levels here. And of course, they mark everybody's finger with the blue ink and all that. But the point is, even India has solved this problem for all practical purposes. I do admit that the way this website was, real quickly, was a map of the United States 
and you would roll over your mouse over a state, it would pop up a number, and then you could drill down into the cases. I honestly don't remember whether it was both voter fraud and uh, 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 election fraud uh, mixed in. I simply remember the number of over 1,000 cases. And what struck me about the number was even that number still proves your point that it's an exception, not the rule, and that it's, it's rare. And what you point now, out with voter, with voter suppression, when you're talking about tens of thousands and you're talking about across several states where it could be millions of votes being suppressed, not only is that treasonous, but that's a much bigger problem. You are absolutely right than voter fraud. I would gladly trade voter fraud for fixing voter suppression uh, because there is no system that's going to be perfect. As an IT guy myself, I shake my head at the lack of cybersecurity that has happened under the Obama administration. And I flag the Obama administration specifically on that because he's the first president that came along at a time when the internet and the internet of all things, which is now uh, right. a huge vulnerability, he's been in office, Mr. Swank here, to you know usher us into the digital era. And yet, if you look at the federal systems, and I saw how just nonsense they were when I worked at Boeing as this stuff was just beginning, uh, if I could see problems back then, and they, a lot of them still haven't been fixed, the amount of, uh, I mean, look at the enormous cost of the, rolling out the Obamacare website. My God, give me $650 million. Uh, I'll, I'll do a website, uh, give me $1 million, I'll do it. It was ridiculous. The, gov the government's IT efficiency, I did want to make a point that there's even a broader problem that I, there's new polling, it was from a. It was done by a, a, a security firm known as Carbon Black, uh, which claimed to be phone polling, I guess. So basically, it it reported that more than 15 people. This is September 29th, 2016. Reported that 15 mil, more than 15 million people may not vote on election day over concerns that uh, the election could be. Uh, rigged due to cybersecurity. So, so what we're having is uh, an issue that is coming to the fore now because of new publicity, and um, and uh, new publicity over this issue of cybersecurity that you're just talking about. So this is based on a narrow online survey. Well, okay, well, it was an online survey of some norms, so I don't know how reliable that is. But let's just say there are many people who are, uh, who are uh, alarmed about this probability of, not probability, or very alarmed. So that lends to uh, further doubt. So that brings me to ask you, what is your understanding of the role that Putin or Russian intelligence have played so far in the election? Anything from uh, potential rigging uh, to WikiLeaks to cooperating with Trump and what might they do based on uh, what they've done in the past in other countries and the new alarms by U.S. intelligence services over Russian hacking for this election? Uh, well, thanks for asking that question. It, it's a very timely one, of course, because unfortunately for the United States, the answer is uh, uh, multifaceted and it overlaps. In other words, if this were maybe the last election or, or when Obama first came into office, it would simply be either WikiLeaks or Russia, one or the other, but not both. Now, here's what's happened. I know for a fact, because I've heard it straight from the mouths of Russians over the years, uh, Prague, for example, was full of, uh, Prague had more diplomatic personnel from Russia than uh, after the Cold War than they did during the Cold War. And of course, many of them are spies and, and all that. So what I learned and have seen is that you have an assessment of the United States by Russia, by Putin's inner circle of the FSB in this innermost trusted intelligence elitist circles. They basically what is said- What is FSB? FSB. It's the new KGB, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, for PR purposes, they changed the name. And what he has done formally just now recently is he has 
reassigned their charter so that it's identical once again to what the KGB's was. In other words, he had them concentrate on external threats. Now he's got them like Stalin, we have internal enemies, we have external enemies. And what he's done is he's figured out, and he's right, and I, and I feel bad about this uh, only because it's, it's the United States and being American, he has figured out that he has Obama's number. He knows darn well that he can basically act with impunity and push it so far that the only alternative is nuclear war to stop him and nobody's going to go there. And Syria is a great example. And one of the reasons I have lost faith in Hillary Clinton is the fact that it was her bright idea with Obama to mess with Syria in the first place after Obama ran on the platform of let's not do nation building, you know, and then he goes in and tries to nation build Syria. And then Hillary, because she was a senator and the first lady of the United States for eight years, through osmosis, if nothing else, should have had the IQ high enough to realize that using a private server was a stupid idea. And although she's apologized for it, thanks to WikiLeaks and, and knowing the Clinton character, Come on, the reason she did it was to get around FOIA requirements because the Clintons are not squeaky clean. So now what you have is you've got Russia in there who absolutely has hacked some stuff. You know, they, they are behind this Guccifer 2.0. The IP addresses have been changed, have been, have been tracked now to the hacking center in Moscow. There's no question about it. They, right. They've even sent emails to the poor... Uh, Czech computer analysts who discovered this and I know some of the people who are involved in that and There's no Guccifer 2.0. It's not the same guy and the Guccifer 1.0 is in prison. So it's Russia and Then you have WikiLeaks which gets data. They don't care who gives them data, but WikiLeaks has a very cynical Deal with Russia, which I'll share with you. You may know about it you remember a few years ago when WikiLeaks was publishing info seemingly on everybody? Well, right. Russia told WikiLeaks point blank, if you go there with us, you're dead. And you know what WikiLeaks will not do? They won't cross the Putin line. People who have crossed the Putin line are dead. They were killed uh, with polonium in London, as, as we all know. They right. can trace the atomic signature all the way back to Russia. And what does the British government do? They can't do anything because nobody's going to start a war over one dead guy. So Russia is exploiting what they can get away with because they have made the determination in their right that they can get away with it. And whoever is the next president of the United States, Russia has our number, America's number, because the goalposts have been changed. They know they can get away with it because they're powerful enough if we tried to do it with Russia, we would be as successful. We're actually better at it than they are. But Russia is not going to nuke us either to stop us from interfering. It's all a bunch of talk. So you have that going on. Then you have WikiLeaks. Then you have a Justice Department and an FBI that seem to be at internal war with each other. You and I both know that these guys like Comey and Loretta Lynch and Podesta, they go back many decades they used to be buddies, uh, co-workers of each other. Now we're supposed to trust all of them to fly straight. Now, Comey, though, has more of a Republican pedigree in his background. And he is considered, they say that there's some reporting that he he leaked in, re, in re, part in response to two uh, perceived political or PR threats, one from a Republican Congress, if he didn't notify them about the new inquiry into these uh, laptop uh, emails by her aide, or also as a way to kind of mollify the FBI agents who were in revolt over their failure to move ahead on the Clinton Foundation criminal inquiry. I don't know what you know about that, So, but I'm just saying there's a difference between Podesta and um, the uh, you know the attorney general versus um, uh, Comey in terms of their ties to Clinton. There are, but I can elaborate on that. Um, now here's here's why. First of all, Podesta was involved in the issue of pardoning Mark Rich, and Clinton right. supporters tend to gloss over that. 
Now, there was, as you know, the FBI released through an automated bot through their Twitter account that these documents had been released through FOIA. A month earlier, there were documents released on Trump's father. So the Clinton campaign said the timing was suspicious. No, it wasn't. The FBI overhauled their processes so that once FOIA documents are cleared and go through the hoops, this automated process puts them on the server and a tweet goes out. It's hands off and God bless them for doing it. Now, was the timing the worst for the Clinton campaign? Absolutely. But that was a coincidence. These FOIA requests had actually been generated last year. And of course, the Clinton campaign didn't complain about any documents coming out on Trump's father. Now, independent of that, people forget that a good barometer, in my opinion, of how the Clintons are, is our cases like March Rich, or, or uh, rather, uh, Mark um, Rich, the criminal financier. I mean, right. come on. And then this is the same president that pardons his own cocaine dealing brother on the last day in office. I mean, even the optics, they're deaf. Just like Clinton, I don't, I don't know what he discussed with Loretta Lynch, but just the idea that you'd show up and, and talk about your grandkids right before you're going to go public with whatever. I mean, he's smart enough to know that the optics would be suspicious. So yeah, I agree. Then, so bring us back to the threats we're facing right. now, yeah. uh, and what Re what what Re Putin what Putin's role could be, or other threats that you yeah. see to the intent. Not counting some of the, you know, we'll, we'll 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 stipulate that the issues of vote suppression and other monkeying around is is a, a real threat. But you have an expertise about Putin and intelligence issues that I don't have and few people have in journalism. I'd love to get your views about what are the real threats that Putin or other intelligence services, you know, from Russia or elsewhere might pose for our election and accepting the results of the election as legitimate. Okay, um, I'll break that down for you after about 15 more seconds. On Comey, okay. the bottom line is this. There's a major publication which says they've broken the story that people inside the FBI tipped off Giuliani that this was going to happen. Giuliani himself was, a, of course, a blowhard and an egotist. He said, oh, yeah, I knew about this back in July. I was expecting it in July. That is a total lie, and let me prove it. First of okay. all, the police, the FBI, did not even seize Wiener's computer till the end of September. Hello, Mr. Time Traveler Giuliani. Therefore, you could not have been expecting this since July because the event never happened. Okay? So, once they seized it at the end of September, the local FBI in New York go through it. They start seeing, oh, there may be some Clinton stuff here. They alert Comey. Comey goes through it, finds probable cause because he promised to... to um, keep Congress informed, was totally blindsided by this. He felt it was better to say something rather than keep it under wraps. He couldn't win either way. But Giuliani's claim is false. I have contacted the reporter asking her, how could you miss this timeline, which is so obvious. Hopefully she Okay, so help, help me understand, because all the reporting is, and then there's new timelines, new stories coming out, like her, one of her, Lara, Lara Trump, who's married, you know, the daughter-in-law says, uh, Donald, you know, breaking. Larry Trump admits Donald Trump's behind FBI's decision to reopen email case, and I think my father-in-law forced their hand on this, you know. But 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 in terms of the Giuliani letter, I I, I want you to I you're saying that his uh, kind of loose threats that we have a bombshell coming out were made back in July and not more recently? Tell me. No, what he did is the other day after this Comey announcement came out or and, and uh, stuff on Wiener's laptop, he's saying, oh, I was tipped off from my buddies at the FBI. I was expecting this back in July. Problem with his story is that they did not seize that laptop until the end of September. That is a fact. So he could not have heard about it in July. And having, uh, you know, he's Giuliani. Come on, look what he said. Okay, so in other words, so in other words, Giuliani himself. Okay, so in other words, let's just for our readers. I'm going to read you what the news story was. Rudy Giuliani said Friday that he knew the FBI planned to review more emails tied to Hillary Clinton before a public announcement about the investigation last week, right. confirming that the agents. The 
leaked information to Donald Trump's presidential campaign. So you're saying that this, and that when he earlier had been, you know, the video of him making, saying we're gonna have some bombshells we've been told about, when did he make those statements? He made those, he made those right before the WikiLeaks dump. And the statement is vague enough that the information could have come from somebody's grandma. If I say I have a bombshell coming and a bombshell comes, you don't know where whether I was talking about that. Oh, oh I see. Okay. That, so in other words, so back in August, and so back in, in other words, in the summer, he began dropping hints about a big bombshell. Yeah. But he was vague enough that any bombshell would make him look like prescient and like an insider. Okay. Now tell me why, again, I'm asking you to, why yeah. is he lying that he's boasting about when Rudy Giuliani confirms FBI insiders leaked information from Trump campaign, why is Rudy Giuliani a liar or falsely claiming credit that this thing happened? Well, only Giuliani can answer that question and I would urge him to be under oath. That's like sending up a red flag to Comey saying, you know, why doesn't Comey call his bluff and say, we're gonna, anal we're gonna investigate who told you this. I'm saying that he's saying he knew about the Wiener stuff in July. That's what he said. Oh, okay. And they got had it. not gotten the Wiener stuff until the end of September. So unless we got an episode of Star Trek here and there's a time displacement phenomenon going on, it's not possible. And WikiLeaks has said for months they were going to have a big bombshell that would end Hillary's career. Okay? Yeah, they've had a big bombshell. And Assange says it's not Russia who gave them the material. We don't know if that's true or not, but I will tell you this to come back to your more important question than Giuliani, which again, I admit I, you know, focused on. Um, Russia has a active plan, and it's back right out of the Cold War days, to basically sabotage our infrastructure. Iran, the Republican Guards, reverse engineered our power grid many, many years ago, around the time of 9-11 actually while Clinton was in power. Because what Clinton did, and it is his fault, you may remember the uh, Cobra Towers bombing. You'll remember that Louis Frey, the director of the FBI, he wouldn't talk to Clinton for over a year because Clinton kept interfering with all data that pointed to Iran. He didn't want to go there. And Frey had to go to George H.W. Bush to get the Saudis to finally give them the data they needed, which proved in the lawsuit that the U.S. always had the intelligence that Iran's fingerprints were in there. So the bottom line is Russian intelligence, because they do view us as an enemy, right or wrong, has reverse engineered our stuff so that if they want to launch a cyber war and make things appear like they aren't, they can do it any time. They are more brazen now than they ever have. The technology and foundation is there because everything's connected to the web by Windows or Android or iOS, this Internet of Things. There's already been a dry run, which seems to have been done by a hacker group, not connected with Russia, the recent attack you referred to where they right. affected the DNS, and a, um, a distributed denial of service attack. I've had those happen on my old website from years ago uh, when I was exposing this UFO cult in Switzerland, which you know about. Um, it's the ba it is the basic thing anybody can do. You use a Tor anonymizer, so it, it turns computers that are out there around the world into zombies. They blindly, without the uh, owner's knowledge, uh, try to hit this website at the IP address. The server becomes overwhelmed. It can't respond in time. And then you can't trace who did it because it's distributed. And if I get your DVR recorder to join me in the attack, you have no right. idea that your machine's doing my dirty work. You just know it isn't working right that day. That's all you know. So right. the problem is that the internet, when it was designed, was never designed to be secure. It was meant for science and communication and all the good stuff. But the bad right. guys realized, hey, we can mess with this. And I'll tell you one other thing I saw when I worked for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory years ago. We used to use a system that was closed that was the ancestor to the internet the old DARPA net and octopus. Sure. Program. Now, here's what I found out back then. I found out that the government, U.S. government, had the great, great idea
to commercialize this and release it to the public because if they could get everyone online, they could spy on them much more effectively than if they hired a billion agents. So what has Obama done, Mr. Transparency? He has empowered the NSA to now have the capability to monitor communications real time. The problem is the data flow is so massive that we haven't caught up to the data flow and I don't know realistically if it's ever going to happen because every month tens of millions of more people get online. Now you've got smartphones, you've got tablets, it's a post PC world. So Russia, just like they did with Ukraine, that was a perfect Battle well, tell, right tell us what you think, are there, what are parallels of things that happened in Ukraine that you think could well happen, and tell me whether you think it's likely, not likely, well, that might happen here on a much larger scale if it, Russia decides to seriously disrupt our election and or the trust we have in the results. Well, the first thing is very simple, and they did this in the Ukraine. If you look at the pattern of what happened, all of a sudden, a ton of online groups showed up in the Ukraine demanding Russian independence, right? Let's be with Russia. Where were these groups all these years? Well, they didn't exist because they were made by the Kremlin. Look at the so-called little green men that came in and seized Crimea, didn't fire a single shot. They looked like they were state-of-the-art stormtroopers. You're like, wow, where did Russia get all of this high-tech stuff? Well, they bought it from Germany. And they had about 100,000 guys and that was it. If there had been a war, they couldn't have sustained it because the gap between those LGMs and the average Russian soldier was huge. Putin has been stalled now in his modernization. So what Putin has been able to do is exploit the situation in the Ukraine because his sock puppet got overthrown in the coup and he was upset, so he carved up Crimea. He was able to do a test run of what will happen to the United States anytime he cares to do it. So yeah, the more that we're unsure of our system, the more that we don't like our candidates, the more that we don't trust the results, the more that we think it's rigged, the more that we think it's paranoid. This is just a modern digital version of the classic Cold War um, playbook. And I'll tell you where it goes back to how far. Do you know who the first books ever printed on Kennedy's assassination in Dallas that promoted the idea of conspiracy came from? They came from France. France is the best country to start rumors in. And what the KGB did under Khrushchev's orders were to start the rumor, encourage it, that Kennedy was killed as a result of a conspiracy. So this, this, pre, this predated Mark Lane? Yes, absolutely. By the time Mark Lane got it, he heard about it from the French, as well as the encounter he had on the steps uh, when somebody said, well, who do you think shot him from the front? Right, right. So, and I was shocked when I did my own 16-year study when I found this book, which is out of print, by the French author, and declassified memos released under Yeltsin from Russia. Prove and the Matrokin archive from the KGB de archive defector prove that the KGB is the one that first stirred that stew pot. In fact, the famous letter to Mr. Hunt from Oswald was forged by the KGB. That's a fact. Oh, okay. That's the so, handwritten note so from Oswald. What's ahead for our election system then? Well, I think you've basically shown, combined with the data I've shared, that we're screwed because. <laughs> Look at, look at voter suppression, my God. If that is not fixed, it's not gonna get better. The Republicans are not gonna reform themselves. You've got a candidate that no matter who wins, the other half of the country is not gonna like the result. I, to be honest, I don't see a way out of this. I, I, I don't, I, I, well, I don't. My view, my view uh, is, and this may be uh, a, sort of a capper of my views is, one way out of it is to try to have a, a rational person, even if she's a corporatist, uh, with some criminal possibilities in charge rather than a completely unfit person. So that's why I'm urging expats to make sure that their votes are counted as well as Americans who may hear this to make sure their votes are counted. Try to vote on paper if you can, like optical scan or any form of paper, but show up and vote because what happens is, uh, and vote, uh, 
my hope is vote for Hillary. Go ahead, vote for Hillary. Because if there's an overwhelming turnout, if there's an overwhelming turnout, that means the ability to use vote suppression or even computer errors, glitches, or hacking to either you know undermine the vote or undermine confidence in the vote is significantly weakened. Uh, so that's the reason that um, it's my view that a strong turnout for Hillary, despite all the weaknesses that you've well chronicled, is sort of a patriotic duty both to the United States and to our planet. I, I agree, and you've said it perfectly. People must vote for Hillary because the alternative is far worse. I think that even if Hillary were to win by a landslide, and I don't think the evidence is there to show that, the problems that must be fixed are going to go are greater than the single term of a four years in office in the White House. But they must begin with the next president. If 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 this isn't at least slowed down, or paused, or not addressed at all, God help us as a country. Because now, when you say when you say if this isn't slowed down, what are the this is you referring to? Just so our no. listeners understand, viewers understand. Uh, again, thank you. Um, I'm talking about voter suppression must be addressed. I'm talking about you have to get big money out of politics. You can't have unlimited money in there. I think the two-party system needs to be reformed. We need a viable third party, one that can at least rise above the status of the Green Party or whatever the other miscellaneous ones are. I think we have to have politicians that Americans vote into power that put the country first rather than their own pet projects first. Look at Daryl Issa, for example. Look at Murtha when he was in power. Those are not shining examples of putting what is best uh, in the interest of the country first. We have to go back to what made us at periods of time a really great nation. And while I think we're a great nation, we have to get rid of this conservatism. We have to keep the government and, and religion out of society to the point where they're oppressing people. I believe we should have, you know, birth control. It should be free to people. How can these Republicans claim they're pro-life when they don't allow a woman to make her own choice? You can't have it both ways. So they, they don't want to help the poor. It, it, it's a tall people. order for reform and something for next, uh, a, a, a next session. I have two... Uh, uh, movie audio visual things that kind of are from a progressive point of view but one is the uh, for just five bucks you can watch on any Amazon platform or iTunes uh, Michael Moore's case for voting for Hillary and then secondly even though he may have stances that I don't agree with about Israel a lot of the fundamental structural problems about what's wrong with democracy are contained very eloquently in a Documentary by on Netflix called by Noam, featuring Noam Chomsky called "Requiem for the American Dream," and it's a very thoughtful analysis of many of the structural flaws that you're just identifying. And it, it even though uh, many of us may find his some of his uh, views too extreme on certain foreign policy issues, his analysis of what's wrong with the structure power imbalances that have helped take America off the rails is very much worth uh, listening to. Well, I thank you for sharing those um, sources that people can check. Can you repeat them one more time real quickly? Yeah, well, in addition to the newspaper items that basically, uh, Brad, if I was just pick two things to get to watch for American political news that you might not always be is Brad blog and then also the Memo Random website. But in terms of these uh, movies that are very valuable, in terms of, uh, also Greg Palast has a possibly alarmist movie out about vote rigging and vote suppression worth looking into. But uh, two things to look at that are very, very recent. One is Noam Chomsky's documentary where he's the featured talker and there's a lot of uh, illustration of his points is called Requiem for the American Dream. And the other is Michael Moore's new $5 movie available on iTunes and Amazon uh, Amazon about the case for voting for Hillary. It's partially uh, about what and he, that is from the point of view of a very strong Bernie Sanders supporter who believes 
not only that Trump is a danger, but that Hillary has virtues that are worth putting her in the presidency. But it certainly will, could help inspire people to work for Hillary. And you can work for Hillary from home by phoning uh, your home phone database through HillaryClinton.com forward slash volunteer. Um, Art, um, I wanna, I'm going to have to end it on that note, but I absolutely want to do this again. You're a fantastic guest. Uh, I really sincerely thank you, and I will add my own point to people listening for what it's worth. I agree that we must elect Hillary, okay? I know I criticize her and the Democrats because I'd like to see them raise their standards, but when the alternative is so much worse, you have to go with the lesser of whatever the two choices are, the one that's better, and that is Hillary Clinton, no question. Donald Trump, if he becomes president of the United States, will, in my opinion, doom what we know of America today. And America is a ship that is bleeding from all different orifices, for lack of a better analogy. And we have to have someone in there who can hopefully reform it. I also supported Bernie Sanders. I have my own opinion about how the primaries went. But at the end of the day, if I have to choose between Trump and Clinton, it is absolutely, hands down, despite everything, Hillary Clinton. Well, that's good to hear. And thank you again for the opportunity to appear on your show and the probing questions you asked and the wide range of issues we had a chance to review. Well, thank you, Art. Thank you very, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Art Levine, he is our honored guest. And Art, again, just thank you. I think people are going to really learn a lot from this show, and uh, hopefully it'll make a very good impression on them, as in make a difference in their minds, and they'll translate that into doing something, because we have to. We can't just sit there and view this as entertainment. It's got to be transformed into action. And the way you start is you vote for Hillary Clinton, let's be blunt about it, and then you go forward from there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Art. Have a good evening.